So you've all recovered from my wife being out here, have you? A lot of energy, mate. Mate, a lot of energy. Hey, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, very exciting. And thank you for, for asking us out here. And Eleanor loved it out here. I uh, just about thought we might be moving out to Waihi Beach. Uh, she loved it out here, and uh, so it's great to be here. Um, I just before I start preaching, I just felt um, if you need healing in your body um, right now, why don't you just put your hand up? If you got if you got a need need for healing, okay. If you're next to somebody who's got their hand up, why don't you just put your hand on their shoulder or something like that? Let's pray. We're we're, we're a family, Father. Right now, we pray for each person that's got their hands raised that needs a healing. Father, we thank you that you're a supernatural God that works in the supernatural here on earth, Father, and nothing's impossible to you. And so right now, I pray you'd heal whatever it is that somebody has of the outstretched hand, whether it's something uh, in their body, bones, if it's something in their system, uh, any of their organs, Father, in their bloodstream. Lord, I just pray that your healing would flow through them. And Lord, even as we just uh, are spending our time here with you, Father, that they would uh, receive a healing in their body, even as they just sit there. Lord, we thank you that your power is always working. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, so I really don't have to introduce much. I suppose my wife told you we've got four children, uh, two boys, two girls. Uh, they're just about at that stage where they're, they're, they're out of our house, which is... Um, I know some people are sad about those things, but, mate, I'm not sad at all. And uh, so that's exciting. And um, I, we've been in C3 City Church. I've been, uh, I took over from my dad, I think, 17 years ago. Still trying to work out what we're supposed to do, but that's okay. Uh, having fun in the process, living the dream. Um, I might just pick up on what you said about family. I had a revelation last year about family that... Uh, um, my mother passed away, and uh, we were at the funeral, and my older sister got up and spoke, and, and she said uh, that for us, as we were growing up, we grew up in Hawara. Anybody from South Taranaki down there, good place. So we grew up um, most for 10 years of my life in Hawara, and uh, my, both my parents had come out from England, uh, from the motherland, and uh, so we, we lived in Hawa, and it was just our five in our family, and really we had no relatives. We had all my parents, relative, you know, everybody was back either in, in England or my father had a brother down in Christchurch. So really we didn't have family around us. And so the church became our family. All my uncles were people in the church, basically, cousins, everybody. It was church was family. And that's how my mother saw church. Church was family. And uh, when my mother died, uh, uh, the Sunday after, a guy came to me. It was, I was just talking in, at the end of church, like you are. You talk with people. And a guy said to me, oh, I'm surprised you're here. And I said, oh, wh wh what do you mean? Well, I know, you, you know your mother's died. I, I, I didn't think you'd be at church today. And I had this revelation that he saw church differently. He had, he's got a great family, really good family, all their kids. And he saw his own personal family as more important than the church family. And I think sometimes we often are like that. And I go, I meet other people and their family life hasn't been so good. And when they've come to the church, the church is their number one family. And I got challenged on how do we see the church family? Do we see, because Jesus made a pretty radical statement when his mother and his uh, brothers were trying to see him. He said, these are my those who do the work of the ministry, they're my brothers and my father. And okay, so just, just to, before you run away going, oh, has the church family got to be important more than my, my, my personal family? No, I think both are important. Both have got to be kept up, up high. And both are a really important part of, of church. So someone who's feeling orphaned should never feel orphaned in church. Someone who's lonely should never feel lonely in church because we're family. And, and so we've all got to, even in our minds, think, okay, I'm a father to some people. I'm a son to somebody else. I'm a brother to somebody else. I'm a mother to some person. Some person is my mother. Like the family, everybody should be taken care of in the church, shouldn't they? There's enough of us. And so I just, I just feel to pray for you guys to be a family. You know, you're going through family stuff. You've got a family meeting this afternoon. How exciting is that? You know, and we need to be family. And, and look, families care for themselves. They have a love level at a different level. Uh, and the church family has a, has a I think, a challenge in that, that we 
love at the same level that we love in our family. You know, like I think about my kids. If, if my kids got into trouble, maybe one did something wrong and had to go to court, I'd go with him. Even if he's guilty, I'm going to go with him. Why? Because he's family. And we should be the same with each other. We go with family. We're strong in our, in our church family. So let me just pray. Father, I thank you for this family. We love the family of God. Lord, we've got a few strange cousins and uncles sometimes. <laughs> But Lord, we love them all. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to have that love at the level that you've loved us and that we'd love like you do. We'd love with a passion. And Lord, we would see people and and bring them in and that, Father, everybody would feel loved, Father. Lord, I pray no one would feel lonely in this family, Father. But Lord, that we would be listening to your Holy Spirit and hearing and being able to go respond to whatever those needs are. We thank you, Lord. I just thank you for this family, and I thank you for even just the the love that I can feel in the room, Father. I thank you for your love flowing through the people in this room. Pray that would continue in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you've got your Bible, uh, I didn't send through my scriptures because I thought, oh, out on Waihi Beach, they'll all have their Bibles, won't they? So so we don't need them all. No? Oh, okay. Um, If you've got your Bible, why don't you just turn to John 15? So the title of my message is Walk in the Spirit, which I think is something that is part of your DNA as a church. If you're talking about freedom, you've got to be walking in the Spirit to live in in freedom. Um, My question to start off with is, can you hear God? When's the last time you heard God speak to you or talk to you or put something on your heart? It is my belief that every one of us should be hearing from God. That it's not something for the people, for special people. It's actually for all believers. If you go back and you go to, say, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, it is my conviction that Adam and Eve could see God and could hear him. They definitely could hear him because because when they'd sinned, they were were afraid because they could hear God coming. Uh, Some would even surmise that maybe it was Jesus who walked in in the garden Eden that talked to them. But their communication with God was very clear. No different than you and I talking, I believe. When they sinned, that disconnected. That put distortion between them and God. It meant they didn't hear the same. And as you sort of walk, walk through the, the Old Testament, it's like it gets, it gets fuzzier and fuzzier. Definitely Cain was spoken to by God, but it gets less and less until there's only Noah uh, that's actually listening to God. Everybody had disconnected from God, basically. And I mean, he gets a pretty clear message about building an ark, which he had, you know, he had to be hearing very clearly from God. And really that sin has disconnected humankind from being able to hear God. It's that, it's that sin between that stops us hearing. Uh, you come to Jesus, and it's my belief that Jesus, because he wasn't born in sin, could hear God clearly. Maybe the same as Adam. And so when we see his ministry, he walked around. What did he say? I just do what the Father tells me. His whole life was spent because he had the Spirit listening to God. Everything he did was about listening to God. And when he gets to the cross, what does he say? He says, Father, like, like he, he, he cries out going, where are you, God? Because for the first time in his life, he was disconnected. He could no longer hear God like he could all through life. Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? He had this experience of no longer being able to hear God. And, and you know, if you've been close hearing God all the time and then suddenly your father's gone, that was, what was that because of? Because he took the sin of the world. That sin stopped him from hearing. And as he died and rose again, what he did for us is it enabled us to get rid of the sin that was stopping us from hearing. The sin disappears, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes so that you and I can hear the Holy Spirit and hear God at the same way as Adam did and as Jesus did. Do you believe that? So why don't we? Why don't we listen all the time? Why are we not connected as much as we should? And why do we settle for not being connected? I think one of the most exciting things and one of the, the, the best things about being a Christian is that you're connected to God and that you can hear Him. 
that you know you're walking in his will. If I was to ask you, are you 100% in the will of God? Are you right on time? Are you ahead of God or behind God? Where are, do you know where you are? Are you hearing enough to know where you are? And I, I'm, I'm always challenging myself, where am I? So we get to, we get to the cross. We've got through the cross. We now have unrestricted access to God. And so we're sitting here, sitting in Freedom Church, Waihe Beach, and we're called to change the world. You're called to change your world. The world's pretty messed up. How many people think the world's messed up? Oh my goodness, it's incredibly messed up. The world's messed up. New Zealand's slightly messed up a little bit, isn't it? The split, a lot, a lot, yeah. That's a messed up thing, it's broken. I know Tarong is pretty broken. Why he though, you're probably living the dream out here, aren't you? It's a bit broken out here though. There's some people that are broken. In fact, at times the church is broken. We're all a little bit broken, aren't we? Got broken stuff in ours. And what's exciting though is that Jesus Mends the broken. I remember reading the, the verse that, and, and have heard it preached for years. Um, you know, Jesus is coming back for a bride that's without spot or wrinkle. And I don't know about you, Church Ivan has got a few spots and wrinkles. Probably not out here, but the church in general has got a few spots and wrinkles. And it's not until you suddenly go, oh, actually, the only reason the church is without spot or wrinkles is because of what Jesus has done. Not because of us, because we're all working through our stuff. We're all trying to get our connection clearer with God. I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but you look, one of the big things that I reckon is why as uh, Christians, once you're saved, you don't always hear God so much, is that we, get, we basically don't purify ourselves enough. I've got a swimming pool. I went in it this morning. It was 17 degrees, uh, a little bit cold. I, I, did, I did go in the spa first before I went into the pool. But both those, my spa and my pool, I've got a filter because bugs get in them. Like, I don't know why we've had so many cicadas in our pool this year. And I've got to go through my bug, my, my pool and, and scoop out all the bugs. And then if I don't do that, I've got to vacuum them off the floor. And I've got to keep this pump going all the time because I want nice, clear, pure water. And I've got to keep doing that because why we live in a world that's full of decay and everything tends towards that and there's a whole lot of rubbish and, and I'm regretting, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking forward to autumn because I know there's going to be lots of leaves in my pool. It's no different with us. There's always stuff coming into our lives and unless we are constantly clearing that out, and I would say daily clearing them out, you actually end up just getting more and more distorted and less clarity from God. We had a guy last week talk about pride. Pride's one of the biggest things that will stop us from hearing God. But okay, let's get to this. I want you to bear fruit. So let's look at John 15 verse 1. I am the true vine, this is Jesus, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified but by the message that I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. So God expects fruit from you and me. I'm always into asking questions because I think when it comes to, uh, when it comes to life and, and definitely preaching is that you've got to look at your own life. And here's my question. How, how much fruit is there in your life? God expects fruit. My, uh, one of my pastors years ago when I was at uni, he preached a message on this and he called it severed, withered, burned. Yeah, I thought that was a bit, bit hard. But, but basically, if you get severed from the vine, you begin to wither. And in the end, you don't produce fruit. So you, so you get burnt like you, you're not doing what God's called you to do. God expects you to produce fruit. What does that look like in your life? Again, one of, the, one of the things that happens to us as Christians who have been Christians for a long time, I think, is that we think we've actually arrived. We get to the stage where, oh, I'm okay now. But no, no, we've all got to continue to produce fruit. We have been purified so there's no restriction. There's no distortion between you and God. 
And if you remain in me, I will remain in you. It's up to us to first remain in him. And so my, my challenge is how connected are you to God? Because I feel at times we just have our connection once or twice a week. Sundays, yeah, yeah, no, I really feel, in the presence of God, I feel connected. But I feel that what happens is, or what God wants for you and me, is that we're connected all the time. That all the time we're listening to the Holy Spirit and he's speaking to us about life. He's there to help us. See, Jesus didn't need an iPhone for his, his diary uh, of, of who he needed to connect with. Well, because why? Because you're just listening to the Holy Spirit. Oh, you need to go see that person. You need to talk to this lady here. Don't go here. And I feel that that's how God wants you and me to live. Now, I'm trying. And it's, it's made life way more exciting. Because all the time you're trying to listen to the Holy Spirit. Uh, even yesterday I was telling the guys as I was, I was driving out uh, to go to a men's breakfast that we had. And my dad had asked me to pick him up. Uh, he lives in... Uh, in this cool sort of retirement village. And um, I, I, I was just driving along and I got oh, probably been only about 30 seconds and I felt the Holy Spirit say, you need to get your keys for his place because I've got a set of keys for his place, but which I don't normally take with me. And you know how you get those little things and you think, oh, do I turn around and go back or do I carry on? And because I'm trying to be obedient, I went, right, okay, let's turn around and go back. Who knows? Who knows what it is? So I get the keys, get back in the car. Oh, it's made me one or two minutes late, you know. I was thinking, oh, no. And just as I pull in to pick up my dad, he rings me. Um, have you bought your keys? I've locked myself out. I said, yes, I have. Because the Holy Spirit's trying to speak all the time. I remember my dad telling a story about when I was about five, we lived in Brisbane. And uh, he, he took the family and we went to go visit another family. And he sort of parked the car on, a, on a, a bit of a hill. And as he got out of the car, the Holy Spirit said to him, lock the car. And he thought, oh, this is a pretty safe area. It's, no, it's fine. He felt the Holy Spirit say, lock the car. No, nah, no, nah, it's, it's a safe area. It's fine. And so he got out and we went in to visit these friends' place. The car's on a slight hill, uh, slope. I, at five, uh, said to dad, my dad, hey, can I just go get something out of the car? And he said, yeah, yeah, just go down and get it out of the car. And it was an, um, so I get into the car to get my stuff, and it was one of the old Holdens. If you remember the Holdens, the Kingswoods, where you, you pull the, the, the brake out, and then you just flick it, and it goes straight in real fast. Put your hand up if you remember that. And that shows how mature and old you are. Great cars, you know, okay? As I'm getting out of the car, I kick that. And suddenly the car starts to roll. And it's um, rolling down and then it had, there was a 10 metre bank. I jumped out as a little kid and it rolled over my leg. Uh, it's all right. I'm fine. I can walk away. Okay. And, and, and just, just about went, just stopped before going over the bank. And my dad came out and he remembered the Holy Spirit had said, lock the car. Uh, all the time the Holy Spirit's trying to save us. I was paying what I call the stupid tax. The stupid tax is not listening to the Holy Spirit. And there's a tax that happens where it's, things happen in your life. If you can live a life where you're constantly listening, that's what God wants. And you've got to remain in Him. You remain in Him and then the power starts to flow. In Pentecostal circles, I think at times we've overemphasized the power on the outside. Now, I believe in the power of God to heal. I, I definitely believe that that's a very important part of the power. But the most important power that you need living in your life is helping you to bear fruit. It's the power of God within that changes us. We've all seen it when someone gets saved. We've got a couple of new people, new Christians in church, and they're so excited. And God's doing amazing things in their lives, changing things in them all the time. But what happens if you've been a Christian for two or three years? I think we begin to rest and we don't let the power of God continue to change us. Because we need a change, don't you? Does anybody feel like they've, they're, they're perfect? Does anybody feel like they're living a life that's exactly like Jesus's? If I went to the, in fact, let's go. Let's run on to Galatians 5.22 just to, to, to be sure. The fruit that should be in our lives is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is the result of the power of God 
working within in us. Last year, I got hugely challenged on the fact that I think that as a Christian, I didn't love enough. I loved God, but I don't think I loved people as much. In fact, if you look at it, if you can't love the people you see, you can't love God or you can't see. Like our love for God and our love for people should be on the same level. I think at times as Christians, we've let ourselves off and go, oh, I love God, but people, we need to love people. That's the fruit. And it needs the supernatural flow of the Holy Spirit to help you to love at that level. Uh, two years ago, I did a, a wedding with the Catholic priest. Uh, it was a wedding because the girl was Catholic and the guy was Protestant and he didn't want um, to get married in the Catholic church, but she wanted a Catholic wedi uh, wedding. So, so the Catholic priest and I did the wedding together and that was fun. And so Father Richard, he did the sermon and he started talking about uh, love as in 1 Corinthians 13, love, agape love. I don't know if you know that agape love was actually defined by the Christians. Before that, it actually wasn't in their language. The language of, of agape came out and was defined as being the love like Jesus. And he went on to say, he said, do you know that the love in 1 Corinthians 13 is divine love? It's the love of Jesus. It's divine love. And you can't love at that level unless you have the divine within. That's pretty good from the Catholic priest, isn't it? Might have to change some views there. That'd be a challenge, wouldn't it? Out the love, the power of God flowing in you should just flow out. And that you should be changing. You should love people more than you've ever loved them before. And I don't know about you, I think that's one of the, 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 the areas that the church in general needs to keep working on. Because I think in, most of the time as a church, we're known as the people that judge. Is that true? Christians are judgmental. I want it to be that people talk to the Christians and go, man, Christians are the people that love. What else is there? Love, joy. I can't, I don't know why so many Christians look unhappy. Like, like joy should flow. And if you haven't got joy, then I go, we all got to work on having that connection with God that it flows out of us. You should be the happiest person to be around. Is that all right? Am I allowed to say that? Do you, do you think that? Again, do you think Jesus was a happy person to be around? I think he would have been. He was grateful, thankful all the time, happy. Peace. Oh, doesn't the world need peace? You and I should carry peace. Where we go? People should feel the peace of God when they're around us. Peace. I was at, uh, in Wellington Airport this week and I was talking to the, um, the, the barista there and she said she was, a, um, she was doing psychology at, at Wellington University. And I thought, oh, okay, that'd be very exciting. Um, and... Um, and she said to me, oh, why are you so happy? And I said, well, I find that if I've got peace inside, it really doesn't matter what's happening on the outside. In fact, the outside, because there's always stuff happening on the outside, isn't there? But if you're carrying peace, people like being around Jesus because he carried peace. Do people like being around you because you carry peace? This is, this is what I'm talking about, that the power of the Holy Spirit should be making us more and more like Christ. And if you don't think you've achieved it, then that's a good thing to know. And, and you want to reconnect with God and go, I'm going to go on a journey. When's the last, one, last time someone said to you, man, you're like Jesus? So Galatians 5, I, was, I did the fruits of the Spirit there in 5.22, but let's just start at Galatians 5.16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Uh, the NIV puts it, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What does that mean? To me, that means I walk through my life connected to God, listening to God. It's that everywhere I go, every, how you put it nowadays is drive in the Spirit. Whenever you're driving, connected with the Holy Spirit. Whatever you're doing, they used to have to walk everywhere, didn't they? They didn't have nice cars. They walked. And so he's saying, hey, walk, do your everyday life connected to the Holy Spirit. Like, and I can tell you, it is exciting. It means that you're listening all the time. Do you know that I've had to pause a lot more? Because I found I was a little bit rushed at times. And, and so when you're rushed, you don't take the time to listen to God. I know what I'm doing. You know, I'm a smart character oh, I can sort that. no no stop listen to the Holy Spirit it'll save you paying the stupid tax 
What's the stupid tax? The stupid decisions we make. Not you, the person next to you. They're the ones who... It's, 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 it saves you because you listen to the Holy Spirit and you take a pause. It could save you a day. It could save you a week of going down the wrong path. Why? Because we're just listening to the Holy Spirit. Then you won't be doing what the sinful nature craves. Verse 17, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desires that are opposite to what the sinful nature, nature desires. Listen, it's not about being good. It's not about doing good. It's about walking in the spirit that the byproduct is, is that I don't want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. I want to do what the spirit wants. It's not about going, don't do this, don't do that. No, that's, that's legalism. Anytime it says don't or should or something, that to me is, is legalism. No, it's living by the Holy Spirit, which makes me want to do what God wants to do. It makes me conscious and automatically I become a better person. I'm a better person because of the Holy Spirit within me, not because I'm a good person. Does that make sense? It's letting the Holy Spirit go through, work through you. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are no, not under the obligation of the law of Moses. So we live our lives listening to the Holy Spirit constantly. That's why I'm going, hey, it's something that should be happening all the time. It's not something that just happens on Sundays and in our connect group or our home group. It's something that happens all the time. I'm listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit. And we follow one rule. Well, maybe there's two. Love the God, Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets, all the Old Testament can be summed up in that one verse. We live by loving. What a great way to live. That's freedom. It's not about all the things. It's, uh, hey, everything I want to do is out of love. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality. The problem with this lineup of sinful nature stuff is that every one of us hears sexual immorality and we suddenly think that the rest are irrelevant. Oh, it's that one. That's the moment. Oh, I'm not doing that. Hopefully you're not doing that. Uh, I'm not doing that. I'm okay. And actually, I think we ignore some of the other ones in there. Let's have a look at those, eh? Impurity. Impurity. What's that? Well, that's anything within my life that's not pure before God. That's the, that's the stuff I was talking about that gets into your pool, that gets into your life. We need to be purifying. Go to God. Purify yourself. I've been taking communion a lot more often. You know, we've got it in, I've got it in my church office. I've got it in the prayer room. I've got it downstairs in the auditorium. Because I think we need to take communion a little bit more often. Why? Because it purifies. It brings you back to, Lord, help me to remember. Thank you for what you've done. It gets rid of the sin because I know, I know we go, look, Jesus forgave my sins and, and I believe forgiven past, present and future. But I think we've got to keep clearing ourselves and purifying us. Lustful pleasures. What's that? Idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension. I had to go look up what dissension was. It's a disagreement that leads to discord or division. A dis so you have a disagreement that doesn't lead to unity, then it's a work of the flesh. I got really challenged on that. I thought, wow, when I have a disagreement, because we're all not always in agreement, are we? I could just start talking about end times right now and we'd all end up at a different place, wouldn't we? But it's okay to disagree as long as it doesn't end up in discord. And sometimes we end up in discord and I go, that's the work of the flesh. Division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties and other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living this sort of life is not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace. Now, I forgot to start, start my time, so I don't even know where the time is. What time are we finishing here? When I finish, don't say that. No, no, no. There's some people down the back that just aren't happy with what you just said. No. Uh, I've got plenty of time. A good 20. Well, we're only going to take, take five more. 
And then the, whoever the musician are, who looks the musician, you just come up and then I'll know that it's time to finish. Okay? <laughs> you imagine if in your house, in your house, everyone listened to the Holy Spirit. What would that be like? What would it be like if your husband listened to the Holy Spirit? You wouldn't have to ask him to do the dishes. He'd just jump up and go, dishes time. You wouldn't have to ask your kids to make their bed. They just do it. They clean their room. They're listening. Because this is what I find. If we're not listening this way, then God starts to try to speak to us this way from our spouse. I'm going to say spouse. I was going to say wife, but that'll get you all on one track. It goes both ways. If we're not listening to God this way, then he tries to get his attention this way. And I can tell you that it is much better that you keep hearing this way. And then we start to discern. We've got to discern, you know, because let me just get it clear. None of us get 100. I don't feel any of us get 100% clear with God when we're hearing. Peter, Jesus says, who am I? And he goes, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, man, flesh and blood's not giving you that. That's come from my father. That's come from the spirit. And then half an hour later, Jesus is saying to him, get behind me, Satan. You know, one minute Peter's clearly hearing from God. The next minute, who's he hearing from? We're exactly the same. You and me. We've all got to be discerning. Discerning the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Discerning what people are saying to us. That's why it's no good just having something and then not submitting it to someone. If you don't submit it to someone, I go, ah, You've got a, a very high chance of getting it, getting it wrong. And we've all had that. I'm a pastor. People come to my office. God's told me. God's told me to do this. And I sit there and go, oh, great. I can't, I can't help you then if God's told you. They come and they go, I think God's told me this. What do you think? Oh, well, then I can add my bit. But if they've already said God's told you, well, mate, if God's told you, you better do it then. But I don't think any of us hear pure 100%. We've all got this little bit of our flesh still. That's why we've got to submit things to people and listening. So let me go back to imagine your household where everyone listened to the Holy Spirit. It would be amazing, wouldn't it? Imagine a church where everyone was listening to the Holy Spirit and in submission one to another and going, we want what the Holy Spirit wants. We want that peace. So my challenge to you, it's to ask the question of how much am I hearing the Holy Spirit? If you only hear once or twice a year, I think you've been ripped off in your Christian walk. We want it to be living, life-giving. We want the Holy Spirit to be talking to us all the time. We just had a, a, a prophet named Michael Maiden come and speak in our church in the, in the week. And he talked at the pastor's thing that I was at at the weekend. And he said he had this vision where he went to, he was in this um, some place, and he said it was a huge, huge warehouse, a huge warehouse bigger than Costco, and it had all these files in it. And he said to God, what, is, what does this mean? And he said, go over to that file there and open it. So he opens this file, and he said, God said to him, in here are all my undelivered love letters to people. And he said there was just screeds of hundreds of letters, love letters, sitting there that were undelivered. And he said to him, I want you to deliver them to people. And I thought, whoa, we know that the psalm says that God's thoughts to you are as much as the sand on the seesaw. The seashore. Seesaw? <laughs> seashore. What's that mean? That for Murray here, God's thoughts are continually towards her, loving her. Now, sometimes people can't always hear and God allows you and me to go, oh, let me give it to you. And I believe, as Christians, we should be the ones that are giving people words all the time. Now, it doesn't sound, you know, don't get super spiritual. It just needs to be a word. Hey, you know, I had an experience where I was, um, uh, I had a lady in my office. She was a business lady that, it, that I was having this one-on-one -on -one with to, to talk about her business. And in the middle of it, I said to her, um, I asked her whether she believes in spiritual things or something like that, and she sort of said, yeah, yeah, I'm open to it. And I said, well, look, I really feel God gave me a, a, a little bit of a word for you. Is it all right if I give it to you? And she goes, oh, yeah, okay. I said, well, look, I really felt God tell me to tell you that he thinks you're an amazing mum. He thinks you're an incredible mum. Lady started crying. I'm thinking, what have I done? What have I done? 
And when she finally got to be able to talk, she said, wow, my daughter tried to commit suicide last year and I thought I was to blame. That set her free. It's, it's just set her free. And you and I are about setting people free. Why? Because we love people. We love people more than we love ourselves. We love God more than we love ourselves. We love people. And so we want them to hear from God. And if we don't do it, where are they going to hear about how amazing our God is? Who's going to tell them how awesome he is? It's up to us. What a great privilege. There's hundreds of love letters that you can give from God to people. What a great thought. Maybe the musicians can come. I had a word for a couple of people. What's your name? Yeah. Carolyn. Carolyn. You gave a word before too, didn't you? Yeah. Carolyn, I, uh, I saw you um, walking into places and changing the atmosphere. You bring life wherever you go. You just bring incredible life. Um, I did see you going into a place and it felt like you had a battle to change the atmosphere. Maybe there was a person, maybe a spirit, I don't know, but there was something there. And I just felt to, too that light is way stronger than darkness. When you shine... The light of Christ that's in you, it doesn't matter where you go, you're going to change that atmosphere. And I see God, maybe you pray it or saying, and that, that whatever, either spirit or person will leave and be out of there. Because I felt uh, it was affecting something around your life as you walk through. Most places you go, you just change the atmosphere because you carry that. But there was this place that it seemed to be a bit harder. And I just saw you praying into it and, and maybe binding it, maybe whatever you feel in the spirit is it. But you, you, the power of God in you is far stronger than any area where you walk and you carry that peace. Um, where's the lady leading the worship? Was it Lauren? Yeah. Lauren, I saw you... Um, in your house and I sort of felt like you had a few things you've really been praying God about and wanting to see happen and and I felt in the picture I got is you're worshipping and and I felt there was a key to your worship it's like uh, worship more than you pray because I feel that you get into the presence of God and in that presence of God you only have to say one line and God does it because God hears you you make away with your worship. In fact, some of the prayers are just going to be answered as you worship and prayer and thankfulness to God. As, as you just, and I just see it in a in a room. I don't know where in your house you, you worship, and, and I see you putting music on and just worshiping, and it and it and just prayers being answered all over the place. Can I pray for you, Father? I just thank you for what Lauren carries in your spirit, Father. I thank you for her worship today. That that allowed us to come into your presence. And Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, that the, the desires of her heart, the things that you've, you've given her, Lord, would begin to happen. Lord, the things that she's praying for would move, we pray in Jesus' name. I don't know who this is for, but I was reading my Bible this morning and I read about how um, Moses comes to Pharaoh to say, let my people go, we want to go and worship. And what happens is because he goes in there, Pharaoh comes back and doubles the weight on the people. It, it, it was like he made it harder for them than, than before. And they all freaked out. They said, stop, stop, stop. You've made us a, oh, I think they said, made us, a, you know, like Pharaoh doesn't like us now. And you've, you've done this by asking us to be free. And I felt there was somebody or maybe a group of people that you felt like you'd stepped into freedom and on the right track to freedom, but it was like all hell had broken loose and it actually got harder. And you're sitting there thinking, have I made the right step in the right direction? Is this really going to give me freedom or do I... Do I sort of, what God, whatever God was doing to get that freedom, do I stop doing that? And my... my prayer to you or my encouragement is to keep going you will come through it may seem like it's got darker but as you walk through we walk through the valleys you know Jesus said as I walk through the valley of death you walk through the valleys you lie down in the green pastures too many people lie down in the valley and they walk around in the green pastures you got to walk just keep walking 
You might be finding it hard and the pace might be, or the weight might be on, but just keep walking. Why don't we close our eyes? Father, I thank you this morning for your presence in this place. I thank you for each person here. No one here by accident, Father. Thank you for that. And Lord, I just pray right now that each person would be able to hear you. If you know there's something that you need to just get clear so that you hear the voice of God, why don't you just do that now? Short accounts of God. I find the Holy Spirit just highlights one, maybe two things at the most. He just wants obedience on those things. So you go to him and say, God, I'm sorry about that. Please forgive me. And as soon as we confess our sins, he forgives us and he clears the way. Well, everyone's got their eyes closed. If you don't know Jesus this morning, if, if you know that you haven't had this relationship this way with God, it's so simple to get. All you have to do is ask him to forgive you of your sins. And he clears away the disconnection. And now we can have a relationship with God. It's amazing. It's incredible. And so if you're here this morning and you know, man, you either never have never connected with God or you have in the past, but something's happened and you just want to get it right. While everyone else in here has got their eyes closed, why don't you just go, Alan, that's me. I'm going to pray a prayer in a moment. I want everyone to pray it, but I just want to know who I'm praying for. If that's you, you think, yes, I just want to pray that this morning. Is there anyone? Okay, I'm still going to pray that prayer because I feel there's three people. that. So we're going to pray this all together. And uh, if that's you, you just need to pray the prayer. The hand, putting the hand up, yeah, that's a good thing, but just ask God to forgive you. So I'm going to pray this prayer. Why don't we all pray it after me? Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. Please forgive me for all the wrong I've done. Please come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. Be the boss of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to hear your voice. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just pray. Father, I pray, Lord, for maybe someone there that needed to connect with you. Lord, I pray they would know that you hear their prayers, that your word says that when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of all our sin. When you forgive, you forget. You throw it into your sea of forgetfulness. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, and I pray that they would know freedom. Holy Spirit, that they would know freedom, that every person in here would know freedom. Thank you, Jesus.